שלום כולם, סליחה על העיכוב. Sorry for the short delay. Brad will be here in a second. I'll just introduce you to Brad. Um, so Brad Newberg is a developer advocate at Google for the open web and Gears. As an open web advocate, he is currently focused on increasing the capabilities of web browsers to render vector graphics, such as SVG, through drop-in JavaScript shims. He is the creator of a number of libraries and frameworks uh, for expanding the capabilities of web applications, such as Really Simple History and Dojo Storage. And he's a core member of the Dojo Project, a popular open source JavaScript framework. Brad also created co-working, an international grassroots movement to establish a new kind of workspace for the self-employed. Beivrit. Brad is a professor in the field of Google in Mountain View, California, and is a professor in the field of open web and gears. He is a professor of many different and different that are used to the improvement of the internet. And in addition, he is one of the most important members in the project of the project Dojo, which is a professor of open web JavaScript. Brad יצר גם את co-working, תנועה בינלאומית, שמטרתה להקים סוג חדש של פלטפורמות עבודה שיתופיות עבור עובדים עצמאיים. Brad ייכנס עוד כמה דקות, הוא פשוט עיכבו אותו במסיבת עיתונאים, אתם יודעים כמה עיתונאים יכולים להיות קצת קשים, <laughs> אז הוא עוד כמה דקות ייכנס. Testing. Hello. Shalom. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. We had a, a press conference right before this, so it ran right into this. I had to run over here. So how's everyone doing? How's the conference going for you so far? See some cool stuff? Yeah? Um, turn this on. So I wanted to say uh, it's really amazing to be here. I don't know, who, who here was in the Gears talk before? Nice. Yeah, I was saying uh, I've always wanted to come to Israel, and I got a chance to come and speak. It's just really amazing to be here. I've always been a fan of the, the tech scene here, companies like ICQ. Um, all sorts of like interesting companies, interesting projects. So it's been really great to get a chance to talk with some of you in the audience here about what you're working on. And I've been surprised in the Gears presentation when I asked things like about JavaScript. Every, the more people here knew JavaScript than the other places we've talked. So like the, the tech scene is really strong here, so it's really cool. Um, so I really appreciate that. So I just want to ask this audience, so who, like what, what's your background in JavaScript? Who uses JavaScript? Awesome. And who's heard of the term open web? Is that something? Nice, nice. Um, so great. Just wanted to put a, a photon sound somewhere in here. So it sounds like there was already an intro of like, who the heck is this guy? Tell me a little bit about you. Who's this schlub up here on the stage talking? I've been waiting to use that. I couldn't use the word schlub in other countries because I didn't know if people would know what that means. But I can use schlub here. Um, so you heard a little bit about some of the things I'm involved in. Uh, I'm an Ajax person. My, my, my motto is I like to get web browsers to do things they weren't really designed to do. Uh, I'm a JavaScript guy, member of the Dojo project. Um, remember something called co-working. So for a long time I was self-employed, but I wanted more community when I worked for myself. So co-working is a way to have that. It's kind of like a coffee shop, but you get to know people a little better. Um, and I'm a member of this group called the Open Web Advocacy Group. And it's really cool. We get to help try to raise awareness of the open web, really work to uh, make web browsers better, faster, do JavaScript toolkits that can help have older browsers do newer things. So I wanted to jump right in and show you things you can do with the open web cross-browser. I'm sure a lot of us as developers have heard about, oh, wouldn't it be cool when you can do this, and it takes a long time. So I wanted to kick this off by showing you things that can be done cross-browser. So this right here is Dojo Graphs. 
That's the real-time data streaming from a server working cross-browser. Right here, you're seeing giant grids, data tables, again, built with open web technologies, being able to display large sets of data. Down here, you see this is uh, processing.js, built by John Rezik. You heard of him, then jQuery. That works cross-browser as well, doing advanced animation and graphics. Again, open web technologies, things you can do today. Uh, this is Yahoo Pipes, again, built with the Canvas tag. Who here has heard of the Canvas tag? We'll be talking about that today. Yahoo Pipes is a really amazing application. You can take data sources, put them together, do interesting things. What I wanted to show you was, again, a really advanced user interface that works cross-browser, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari, using the Canvas tag. This is a Zoho database. Zoho is a really amazing uh, company. Again, cross-browser, open web technologies. You're seeing data visualization. You're seeing embedded spreadsheets. This is built with HTML, JavaScript, CSS. So you don't just have to do boring forms. You can do things cross-browser today with the open web. This is one of my favorite ones. This is the Apple site. This is the Apple store. And you might expect that that uh, this is built with something else. But no, again, open web stuff, standard browser technologies, cross browser. You can zoom into what you might buy, look at it from different angles. Again, works today. And finally, things like Google Docs, being able to go offline using things like Gears, which is a part of the open web. It's uh, open source, part of something called HTML5. So you can take web applications offline today, cross browser. So I started with this just because hopefully there's something that you saw in one of those quick demos that you didn't know can be done today across your existing user base. Hopefully that raised some of the expectations of what you can do with the open web and also things that you can start doing today. So one of the, the common questions is, okay, what is the open web? What is this term? You know, we're tossing this term around for open web. So what is it? So I want to give you five things that make up the open web. These are sort of five principles. The first one that makes up the open web is cross-platform standards. Now when I say standards, I don't mean, it doesn't have to come from a particular organization. It just means a description of how to do something so that someone else can also do it. And by cross-platform, the open web is about being able to access the web from many different places, Mac, Linux, Windows, mobile devices. So this is one of the uh, key parts of the open web. The second aspect of the open web is at least one open source implementations. This is not ideological. Not everything has to be open source. But the open web needs at least one open source implementation. That's a, a big aspect of the open web. So you have things like Firefox, Chrome open source JavaScript toolkits. This is a big part of the open web. The third big part of the open web is no vendor lock-in. There's not one vendor that controls everything. There's many vendors. Many people can help add things to what's going on on the web. And that leads to the fourth thing, which is that anyone can innovate. Someone in this audience can add something new to the web, big companies, small companies, open source, anyone can innovate. I love this drawing right here. This is from a patent application. It's a suit with spikes on it. What do you think it's for? What's that? That's awesome. No one's gotten it. You're the first. This is the first audience that's gotten it. So that's a suit to protect you from sharks. Did you just guess that or you actually used the suit? Because <laughs> I always ask who wants, to who wants to beta test the suit, right? Um, so the idea is that anyone can innovate on the web. They may not always be the best ideas, but anyone can innovate. Just like you can make a, a shark protection outfit if you want. And the fifth aspect of the open web is universal, powerful clients. And when I say clients, I mean web browsers. So you saw in the keynote that great slide that was like the web at the beginning, and you saw the old browser. And then you saw sort of you know, Google Maps or Street View. Browsers are, have come more and more and more. And they're all about 
if you look at the open web, let's make them more powerful, more universal, get them in more places. So that's a big aspect of the open web vision, really making web browsers more powerful so they can go offline, so they can do multimedia and, and advanced graphics. So those are the five what is the open web things. And then there's a footnote. These are sort of aspects of the open web that they aren't always true, but they're generally true. These are important on the open web. The first is that the open web is mashable. And uh, I always wonder how that translates, right? Do, do people think that means mashed potatoes? Um, <laughs> so by mashable, what I mean is that you can take data from this website and, and integrate it with that website. Not always, but a lot of times you can. So you could take real estate listings from over here and some web-based mapping thing here and put them together. It's a big part of the open web. And hyperlinks are a part of being mashable. The fact, you know, we, we take them for granted now, but hyperlinks are really cool. The fact that you can point at anything, you can point into things, that's being mashable. That's a big part of the open web. Another big part of the open web, the footnote, is that it's searchable. If you take any of the formats of the web and you crack them open, they're human readable. And machines can work with them so that we can search over them. And the, the final aspect of the open web is that it's integrated. JavaScript, CSS, HTML, they work together. They're not over in a black box by themselves where you can't do anything. They're not separate pieces. So that's sort of what the open web is. And so the, the common next question is, why should you care? OK, there's this guy up here. He's talking about the open web. What, you know, why should you care? And I like to say there's two kinds of, there's two kinds of people. There's sort of idealists. I'm more of an idealist. And then there's, there's pragmatists. And so I'm going to give different reasons for the idealists in the audience and different reasons for the pragmatists. And of course, both sides will probably be like, eh, who cares about that other reason? But uh, I'm going to give different reasons. And I like to say the idealists, I'm like an idealist, sort of like, uh, they sort of like want to do things because it's the right thing to do, because it's possible. Um, whereas a pragmatist kind of just wants to get things done. They're like, is this, uh, is this a simple solution? Will this help my business? Will this help me solve my problem? So I'm going to give different reasons. I don't know. No one in the, no one in the audience looks like either of of these, I didn't dress like that today. But uh, so, if you're more of an idealist, um, I, I feel like the open web matters because when they write the history books of the, of the, the last century we just saw and the one we're going into, the web and the internet is going to be a, a big part of those history books. There's not too many inventions that are going to be in there that will really matter when things look back. So the web is, is going to be seen as, as mattering. And it's really amazing that, that we as computer scientists and business people can make an impact on that. That we can really help continue to keep the web open, make sure that it's friendly to startup companies, make sure it's friendly to developers. So that's really cool. I mean, we're lucky that we get to work at this time to make our impact on the web. And I like to say, uh, this is the idea. for the pragmatists in the audience, you're probably like, ah, whatever. But for idealists, um, What's nice is I like to say it's like the Library of Alexandria has landed on our laps. You know the Library of Alexandria? Yeah. Um, that's amazing. I mean, we have this large resource. So it's our responsibility to do things with this that continue to keep it as something that's open and accessible. So for the pragmatists, they heard that and they're like, OK. So if you're pragmatic, the, when I use the term open web, that's just a fancy term for HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. The open web matters to you because it's the safe thing to do. Generally, it's what you're already doing. You're building things for the browser. And it's in your interest for the web to continue to evolve. Because you don't want to have to throw out what you just did a few years from now and replace it with something else. Also, as a developer, Learning the open web is, is the most secure thing to do. It's used in more places than anywhere else. You're not learning some technology that's only used in this shop over here. When you learn the open web, those skills are unbelievably transferable. So those are some reasons 
for the pragmatists for why the open web matters. And whenever I say open web, in your mind, you can just say, oh, that's just HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and the web browser. So why should Google care? Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in, in being uh, transparent. So you might be like, you know, why did Google ship me from San Francisco over here to stand on this stage? And you saw some of it uh, in the keynote. And I'll kind of just reiterate it a little bit. So here's our motivation. So for Google, the more users that we can get on the web, and the better we can make web browsers. By the way, if you want to understand a lot of what we're doing in our developer program, this is a really great way to see our motivation in general. So the better we can make web browsers, the more searching will happen, right? The more use on the web, more searching happens. The more advertising we can show, and the better we can make applications like Google Docs. And this translates into money, into revenue. I'm sorry, into revenue, <laughs> into shekels. Something I love about Google is we try to find places where we can have enlightened self-interest. So what's really nice is it's not just about revenue. It turns out that this kind of work also helps increase revenue, but we also do it because it's the right thing to do. It's sort of the idealistic and the pragmatic together. Um, we, you know, Google was born on the open web. We're powered by open source. I mean, Linux fills our data centers. Uh, when, when, the, when the web evolves, it gives us new capabilities. So that's what's really great. We both believe in the open web because it's the right thing to do and because it directly impacts our revenue in a positive way and our bottom line. So that's, if you want to understand, you know, our motivation and why I'm up here. So I just want to show you just a little bit how that open web stuff that you just saw kind of fits into some of the Google developer program that you may have seen today. Sort of how that commitment to the open web underlies it. So the first one is things like Google Gears. So what does that have to do with the open web? Well, in case you don't know, Gears is a browser plugin that hooks into current web browsers and gives them new abilities. So we don't have to try to upgrade the whole web. And that helps solve the open web problem of getting new features out there that you can use without having to wait a very long time, you know, in our lifetimes, right? Because it takes, it's taken a long time to have new things show up in enough places that you can use it. Um, so Gears is trying to help with that open web issue. Chrome. Chrome is trying to help the open web issue of making the web a more reliable place, a faster place for web applications, not just websites. So it's trying to further that, that part of the open web. Even Android is a part of this open web idea. So Android is, is an open source operating system for mobile devices, and so we want to make it easier to deploy for mobile devices, for things like the mobile web, uh, as, as more and more people move into that environment. Even things like open social, which is all about having the open web idea show up for social websites so that you can make, so that people can just do a little bit of JavaScript, CSS, and HTML to have a social experience and keep that open in an open web way. So there's lots of other technologies, so I can't necessarily say how the open web underlies them, but that's kind of a taste. And then there's the open web advocacy group where our goal is to really just do things like this, give talks like this, do open source work that actually helps evolve the web in a positive open way. So before I talk about the agenda today, I want to say at any time, uh, if I'm talking too fast, if you have a question, if you disagree with me, raise your hand. Um, and so the agenda, the way this talk is going to work is I'm going to kind of give you a state of the open web. And I'll give you these little lightning talks. And I can't cover everything. The open web has, has gotten so big, we'd be here for hours. And I'd love to talk with you for hours, but uh, you know, we'll just have to kind of cherry pick different interesting aspects of the open web. So for example, like vector graphics is going to be one of them. And then for each of these, I'll give you an introduction to what this thing is, like what is the canvas tag. Then you'll see a browser demo, because you don't just want to see code, so it's dance, monkey, dance. We're going to make the browser dance. Um, you know, you want to see this actually working in the real world, so you'll see a demo of that particular part of the open web. 
Then you'll see a code sample, actually a Commodore 64 code snippet. You'll see a code sample using this particular aspect. What was a, what was a machine like in the 80s? Was the Commodore 64 big here? Is there some? Yeah, it was big? Nice. In one country it was Timex Sinclair. I want to say the, the old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then once you've seen a code sample, we're going to talk about browser compatibility. Sort of Edward Moons, this is the thing that developers struggle with. So you'll get to see for something like vector graphics or the canvas tag, you know, what browsers does this work in? What doesn't it? And then you'll get for each of these a stamp. So is this ready? What's the report card? Is this not ready? Is it almost ready? So you'll walk out knowing a little better, is this something you can use today? And then I'll talk about something called JavaScript shims for each of these. And these are a, a painful but necessary reality. And many people don't know what a JavaScript shim is. This is um, generally an open source library you can drop in your web page. And what it does is it does tricks to make older web browsers do newer things. And it might really uh, raise your expectations because uh, you can use these to do things today that maybe you didn't realize you could do. A, a lot of those were being used in the earlier demos you saw at the very beginning. So for each of these, you'll also hear about JavaScript shims. I like to say they can kind of accelerate the future, kind of make it accessible a little earlier. So let's jump right in to vector graphics. So what are vector graphics? We're going to talk about vector graphics on the web. So vector graphics are when you draw on the screen, but you use mathematical equations to describe what's on the screen. So if you have a circle, it's the equation for a circle. And this is in contrast to raster graphics or bitmap graphics, uh, things like GIF, JPEG, ping, where, where they're just an array of pixels. And this is really easy to convey with an image. So we have, we have a, a graphic of a, of a ice cream or a, a, a soft drink bottle. Up here, when we zoom in, this is the vector. So you zoom in and it stays beautiful. It doesn't pixelate. When you zoom into a raster graphics, it breaks apart. And vector graphics are more and more and more important because users have really big monitors now, so things may get bigger. They have really small monitors like cell phones. And users' expectations have been ra rising every year around user interfaces looking better and better and better, right? Once you use an iPhone or an Android device and everything smoothly jumps around, you start expecting that from other places. So how do you do vector graphics on the open web today? Well, there's two choices, something called the canvas tag and another one called scalable vector graphics, or SVG. We're going to cover both. So first off, who's heard, I mean, who's heard of the canvas tag? I already saw. Yeah? And how about SVG? Nice. So let's jump in with the canvas tag first. And you're going to see that format, those sort of lightning talks. We'll do a lightning talk on canvas. So canvas is an HTML tag that you drop into your page. It's just like the word canvas. And then it's a JavaScript API that allows you to draw on that tag. Let, let me start with a demo. So this is, you are looking at Fire, uh, Safari 3. This is all built with the Canvas tag. It's all the drawing. We jump over to Firefox 3. We see the same thing. You'll see this a lot. I want to show things that are cross-browser. That's when it gets interesting. And then we jump over to Internet Explorer 7, and we see the same code working the canvas tag, we're still being able to draw. Same code base. So here's what some of that code looks like. Remember I talked about, there's your tag, you drop that in. Here's our JavaScript, so we grab the canvas. Then you get what's called a context, that's your drawing surface. This is always intriguing here, how it says 2D. Just leaves the door open for 3D. I guess if you're really wild, 4D, right? You want to draw a hypercube? Uh, you know the idea? Thank you. Yes, it is wrong. That, that's, for, that's for the other canvas up here. I'm kidding. Um, yes, and then once you have the reference, um, so you, that's great. You're the first person in like four countries who's caught that. It's good. Are code reviews more tougher here? You can't, we didn't comply, exactly. <laughs> Um, and then right here, you just call methods. So here we set a style, we're setting a color, and then we're drawing a rectangle. 
at x, y, width, height. So it's really straightforward. So the Canvas API is a bunch of methods like this. Draw circles, paths, things like that. All right, here's our first report card. Um, what you'll see is we'll have different browsers, two versions of Firefox, Safari 3, i6 and 7, i8, Chrome, iPhone. People always ask why not Opera? Because number one, I wanted to fit everything on one slide. And number two, you can assume that Opera supports everything that you'll see today, generally. Opera has excellent support. So what you'll see is we'll have yes, no, and then almost. So when we look at Canvas Tag, sort of the state of Canvas Tag, we see things are really pretty good. We have native support across a bunch of different things. Internet Explorer actually has no native support for the Canvas Tag. But, what's that? <laughs> With the Canvas Tag. Yeah. So we need one of those JavaScript shims that I talked about. And, I'll, talk, and I'll, I'll discuss that. But that makes Internet Explorer 6, 7, 8 uh, work using the standard, the Canvas standard. So is this technology ready? This technology is very ready. Canvas can solve lots of interesting problems. You can use this cross browser. You drop the shim into your page when you're working with Internet Explorer. Uh, let's talk about that shim. It's called Explore Canvas. Uh, someone named Emil Eklund kicked it off. He works for Google, and Google helps maintain it and helps put this out there. It's open source. Under the cover, it uses something called VML, or Vector Markup Language, which is a proprietary drawing standard that IE has supported since about Internet Explorer 5. But you don't have to know that. Externally, you, you see the Canvas tag. You see the, that API. One thing to be aware of is you have to be careful with performance. As you saw in the demo, you can get good performance, but as you develop, you should test both environments. So if you choose a good code path, you can have a good performance, but it's something you should be aware of. And there's the URL to grab it. At the very end of this, I'm gonna have a URL where you can download the whole slide if you wanna get these uh, different URLs. So any questions about uh, Canvas before we jump to SVG, actually? Hmm? I'm so, so the, the, the sample you saw in terms of when, when you use coordinates, so are they, are they vectors? Generally, what they represent are, is, a, is a vector space. You can think of them as basically pixels, but the um, measurement will change based on the resolution of the canvas tag. Does that make sense? That's what's unique about it. So if you set, you know, if you make a line that's, you know, 10 units long, but the whole screen gets really big, it's just going to expand to look like a nice line and not a bunch of little dots. So internally, it turns into pixels at the end of the day, but you don't see that. Makes sense. So let's, let's jump to SVG. What this is is a markup language for graphics. So just like HTML gives you a form tag, gives you a button tag, SVG gives you a circle tag, a path tag that you can drop into your page just like HTML. Again, let's start with a demo. This is Safari 3. This is built with SVG. These images, we're scaling them, we're rotating them, the round corners, the handles, event handlers, it's all built with SVG. We jump to Firefox 3. We see the same demo running. Again, scaling, doing interesting things. A code sample. Like I said, it's a markup language. So before you use SVG, you have to surround it with a little block that says SVG. And there we are using the rectangle tag. So you just give a width, a height, uh, X, Y. And then we make the outline green, stroke fill green. So there's just a bunch of tags like this and properties. And, and there's cascading style sheet properties, just like you would. You can change. Uh, different aspects of how things are drawn. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. One really nice thing about SVG is just like how you can put event handlers on HTML, you can put event handlers here. Or just like with JavaScript, you can grab things on the page using get element by ID, do the same thing with SVG. So you use your same programming skills as you would. What's that? I don't, unfortunately. Do I have any examples is the question? No. 
I've kept the code samples a little small because we're going through a lot of topics. So where's, what's our report card? So what's interesting is SVG has been one of those technologies that we've been hearing about for a long time. The last year, something interesting has happened. It's secretly crept into, into almost all the browsers. So it's in, what's that? Almost, yeah, exactly, as you'll see. So it's, it showed up in Firefox 2 and 3. It's much stronger than Firefox 3. It's shown up in Safari 3. Um, Opera supported it. Chrome supports it. The latest version of the iPhone update has SVG. So that's really, that's really exciting that it's shown up. Internet Explorer, unfortunately, doesn't natively support it. So currently, SVG is not ready to, to, for you to be used. But just like you saw with the JavaScript shim for the canvas tag, if we could make one for Internet Explorer, it would really change the situation, especially because all these other browsers have really good SVG support. So something that the team I work with has been working on is an SVG shim. And I wanted to give you a sneak preview of this. Um, it's not done. I have, uh, I have a lot more work to do. But once we have something like this, it'll help to, 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 to shift the situation and this will become something you can actually start using. So this is a, a sneak preview. So what you're looking at here is Internet Explorer 7. This web page is dropping the JavaScript shim into it. And what we have is an embedded SVG block. That's SVG. Inside, we actually use Flash because it's in 97% of the install base. And we do tricks to have the SVG look real to the browser. So your JavaScript can manipulate it. It looks the same on the page. You don't see the flash. And then things work normally on other browsers. And uh, something that's unique is right down here, we've got another SVG block where we're animating it using JavaScript. If we pop open, this is the developer toolbar, and we look at the structure of the page, that says SVG, that says rectangle. We trick the browser. It looks like normal SVG. That's important because uh, it feels like the standard. Right here, we're dynamically creating SVG using JavaScript again, using uh, the circle element. So that's just a, a sneak preview of, of the shim. So that'll, that'll really help to transform the situation there. So a common question is, do we need both? Why do we need Canvas and SVG? Well, we actually we need both for the vector web. They do different things. Uh, Canvas is actually really good for something like a video game. It's what's known as an immediate mode API. It's just like painting on a canvas. When you paint a bunch on a canvas, things lose their identity. It's not as easy to do event handling, to sort of refresh things. SVG is what's known as a retained mode. This means it understands better as you build things up as a tree what you're looking at. And generally, you need both of these things when you're doing graphics. All right, so let's jump to another. Yes. Uh -huh. Say that one more time. Uh, why is uh, the Canvas or SVG better than Flash? So I'm not, so the question is why is Canvas or SVG better than Flash? I'm not saying, I, I've used Flash in many projects. I think it's a great technology. Um, for something like animation and drawing, it's something that the web itself should be able to provide primitives. When you move into Flash, you have to take on a whole other development environment, which has many strengths. There's lots of good things to say about it. But if you want to use JavaScript and HTML and CSS, things like Canvas and SVG make a lot of sense so we don't have to juggle so many different environments. Flash is competitive for many things. YouTube uses it. It's a great answer. Um, this is just increasing options in terms of the web itself. So it's a good question. So let's look at Ajax history bookmarking, another sort of piece of, of the web, the open web. Who here has built an Ajax application or is currently building one. So you know how when you build it, like the, the back button and the forward buttons kind of start working a little weird and the URL, like if user bookmarks, have you experienced this? Something you've run into? So I want to talk about this little part of the open web. So Ajax history and bookmarking is all about making Ajax applications like Gmail work with the back button and forward button and make them bookmarkable. Like if you go to Google Maps and you drag around, then you want to bookmark where you've gone. 
So where are we with that cross-browser? Well, I want to show you a demo first. This is Internet Explorer 8. Um, it's the beta. And Internet Explorer 8 actually supports something called HTML5 history. So it natively supports telling you when the back and forward button have changed for an AJAX application. What you're seeing here is we've got some links. And we've got our URL bar. And when the user clicks them or they change the location, we're going to have a little event listener that will print it out. So right there, that says A. And it updates here so we know that it's changed. If someone clicks B, it would change right here. If a user manually changed the URL, generally you put your state after the hash for an AJAX application. We know that as well. So if the user hit the back and the forward button, but they're still on your page, your app would get a listener and you could update yourself. And let's see what some code looks like with that. So this is the HTML5 way of doing things. You have a new listener on hash change, right? And then when the hash changes, our function gets called, and we can get it. So your application could see that and then update its user interface, which is how you do AJAX history. So where do we stand with that? Where do we stand on the open web in terms of having our AJAX applications work well with the browser? Well, we're actually in a really good state. As you see, many of these browsers have, uh, have good support. Internet Explorer 8 is the standout. They natively support being able to do this. And again, what's interesting is these other browsers actually use a JavaScript shim, which I'll talk about. And many people are doing this. Um, you know, major websites use these techniques and use these, these JavaScript libraries. So this technology is something that is ready. If you're building an AJAX application, you should be using one of these JavaScript toolkits uh, or these shims that will do it for you. And I'll, I'll tell you what some of those are. And uh, what are, here are some uh, really good options. They're all open source. One's called DS History. Uh, it's a really strong option. Yahoo has a great one called YUI Browser History Manager, which they use. So for example, if you go to the Yahoo homepage, you see those little tabs you can click on. Those, are, those use AJAX. And they use this library to make sure the user can bookmark and back and forward button. And then really simple history is a nice option. That's a library I was involved with. Another thing you can use to have AJAX history and bookmarking. So, okay, let's jump to another part, another little lightning talk here. It's hard to talk about the open web and not talk about JavaScript toolkits. This has been one of the real strengths of of the open web is you have a lot of options. In fact, sometimes you kind of have almost too much options, right? In 2007, one of the ways that uh, you pick a, a JavaScript toolkit, there's so many options, you could just sort of throw a dart. But in terms of the state of the open web for JavaScript toolkits, we've seen something really interesting. In 2008, this year, things have kind of converged on four toolkits. And I would actually add YUI as well. So Dojo, jQuery, Prototype, and GWT. Who here uses at least one of these? What's that? I can't hear you. Where's MooTools? Yes, no, I know MooTools. Unfortunately, and generally, in 2008, things have converged towards these toolkits um, in general. And, and that's the thing. There's been a lot of, there's a lot of interesting experimentation there's a lot of toolkits that, that might fill other people's needs. But in general, folks have started converging on these four toolkits, as well as YUI. Um, and I would even say, if you're building an AJAX application in 2008 or 2009, you should be using a JavaScript toolkit you know, as, as soon as you get to a certain size. If you start finding that you're making your own toolkit, stop. I know it's a lot of fun, but you don't want to maintain your own toolkit at this point. There's a lot of great options. Again, something that's really interesting that's happened is traditionally, people saw these toolkits differently. The old way of seeing these was that prototype was the really small library. You would just kind of put it on your page, and it was really lightweight. GWT was for the folks that did not like JavaScript. You know, if you love Java, hate JavaScript, you'd use GWT. 
jQuery was the new kid on the block that had a different way of doing things where you'd use these cool like query syntax to grab the things on your page and jump through them. Who here's used jQuery? Yeah, it's nice, huh? Like that query syntax really changes things. And then Dojo was seen as the sort of like soup to nuts, big toolkit that, you know, had it if you needed it, had everything, but it was considered big. In 2008, something really interesting has happened. The toolkits are all sh coming to the same place, right? Prototype used to be the small one, but now jQuery is small, and Dojo has a really small core that you can use. It's like 23K gzipped that does a lot for you. So all the toolkits now have a really small core if you just want a little bit of stuff on your page. They've all ended up in the same place with plugins. So Dojo had, used to have a real strength with Dojo X. Like if you needed it, it was there, right? That was a really unique thing about Dojo. But now, the other, uh, the other folks have that as well. So jQuery has a really strong plugin community. So you got the core for the core stuff, but if you need extra things, you can kind of put those in. And, and uh, Prototype has a strong plugin community too. And finally, they've all ended up in the same place when it comes to user interface. So again, traditionally Dojo had Digit, which is nice, like a calendar widget, and Prototype had Scriptaculous, which was really nice animation. Well, they all have the same thing now. jQuery has good animation. They have really good widgets you can put on your page. So what's really nice is no matter what toolkit you choose, they've all ended up in the same place. They've seen what works and what doesn't. And generally have found that this way of doing things is what works. And no matter what you do, JavaScript toolkits are ready. This is one of the real strengths of the open web, is, is having these at your disposal. So I want to jump to uh, web fonts, sort of touch on something else. So what is this? I mean, what do you think it is? It's obviously advanced typography for the web, being able to draw really nice fonts on the web so you don't have to do bitmapped images. And the reason this matters is it can really help with search engine optimization. Right? If, if you have all your fonts and headers as images, search engines can't find that very well. And it helps with accessibility. It helps with people that, that you know, can't see what an image is as well. I want to show you a demo. This is Safari 3 running Dojo GFX fonts. These are uh, web fonts. So we see, we see them displayed in Safari 3. We jump over to, actually, Firefox 3, we jumped over to, and then Internet Explorer 7. This is another web font thing we, using Dojo GFX fonts. We see the fonts rendered. If we go back to Safari 3, we see the same demo running. That's Tom Trinka, actually, one of the developers. So you're starting to see web fonts show up cross-browser in a way that you can use it. Um, the web font situation is complicated. I won't go into all the different things. Today, you have to use a shim. You can, you can do some cool things. But under the covers, the different browsers support different things. But they're starting to converge in a similar way. Here's what uh, an example looks like. Um, using CSS, you give a font face. You name your font. And then you give a pointer to the file. So this is to a true type file. And then you just use it, like any other web font. So they are using it, and it will go to sans serif if the font's not there. So what's the report card? Where do we stand with this? Well, Safari 3 is the winner. They're awesome. They support all these great sort of open standards for it. Um, IE8 supports its own thing. At the end of the day, you'll have to use a shim, which I'll talk about, which does some cool things. Web fonts are something that are almost ready. Safari. Opera, Firefox, they've been working together to do some really cool stuff around this and advance it. And today what you can do is you can use Dojo GFX fonts. There's a link. This is a library that will work, including on Internet Explorer, and you can do really nice fonts that are, that are search engine friendly and so on. So this is a really great option. Something called Cipher as well. It's a little more involved, but it's a nice option for some use cases. And it's just a kind of a taste of the future. This is Safari 3 running native support using the code segment you saw, which is the standard for web fonts. I'm sorry, what's that? How come iPhone doesn't support it? Because iPhone uses Safari. 
Yes, um, I believe that the very, very latest rev of the iPhone might have web fonts turned on. But it's slightly different. It's a slightly smaller subset of WebKit sometimes, but they've been moving towards things like this. It's a good question. I just, I just want to make sure I, um, I have till three. Is that correct? Any time check? Yeah. So um, I'm just going to run through this sort of CSS. We all, a lot of us use CSS. So what's the state of CSS? Well, a lot of the browsers have really good support. I wanted to tell you something cool called CSS effects, where you can do things like animation, reflections, masks with CSS. It's really an interesting pointer to the future. There's something called CSS 2.1. Why does that matter? Well, it gives you what are called new selectors. And I'll show you one of those. There's something called CSS 3. And why does this matter? Well, it gives you multi-column layout. So you don't have to use all these tricks to get multiple columns. Who's done like the floating div type things? Yeah. So this will natively, you just say, I want two columns, put it over here, things like that. So here's, uh, this is Safari 3.1. This is all done with CSS, CSS animations. So you can just sort of bind rules. See some of the code there. It's really straightforward to use. Again, this is CSS, I'm sorry, this is Safari 3.1. This reflection is done, again, with CSS effects. You can do masking. So here we take one image. We're going to mask it over the other to do a nice fuzzy outline, again, using CSS. This is a gradient, CSS gradient. So cool things. Uh, here's a CSS 2.1 example. Remember I said it, you get new selectors? A selector are these things right here that you bind on a, uh, a rule. So here we are, we have a div with some custom attribute. This is a CSS 2.1. So we say if that my attribute equals hello, make its background color blue. So where do we stand with this one? I'm not going to do a report card because it's, it's a little more complicated. Where do we stand with this? So those cool CSS effects, are those ready to use? Where do we stand with that? Unfortunately, those aren't ready. Uh, only Safari 3 currently supports them. But there's this really cool dynamic that's happening with Firefox and Chrome and Safari. They're all taking good ideas from each other. So Firefox 3.1 is starting to take some more of these ideas. CSS 2.1, that's more and more ready. I mean, all these kind of things. Uh, IE7 supports a lot of it, and IE8 is going to be a real standout here. It's supporting the full standard. And CSS3, unfortunately, is not ready. I didn't get to talk about the multi-column, but uh, only Firefox 3 and Safari 3 use these. So I'm going to, who here has heard of HTML5? So this is uh, an effort to make a new version of, a, of HTML. Last one, the current one is HTML4. Um, Ian Hickson kicked it off. And it's actually two pieces. It's two parts. The first one is to document how the web currently works, right? So not how it should work, but as a document that says, here's how it really works. So you can build your own browser. You can, you can parse it. The second part is a bunch of new features, like really interesting new features. And here's kind of a taste of some of these. In HTML5, a lot of times, um, it's taking things that already exist. So the drawing, it's just documenting the canvas tag and telling you how to use SVG. So all sorts of interesting things like this. And a pony. There's all sorts of new uh, interesting features in HTML5. Unfortunately, HTML5 itself is not ready to use because it's still being created. But one thing that's nice is the different browsers are taking little pieces of it. So IE8 has some stuff. Firefox 2 has supported storage, client-side storage. That's really nice. I just want to pause. Uh, what, what, what kind of questions do folks have so far? Yes? What about video? What about video? It's a good question. I'm happy you asked. There's a video. There's a very quick video thing. So the question is that FLVs, the flash, flash streaming video files can't be played in, um, in open, uh, open source software. So I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk, let me talk about the open web. I'll, let me jump through the XML web. So a video on the web. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so HTML5 has a video tag and an audio tag. 
that you can drop videos into your page. Let's actually see a demo. This is a, a, a build of Opera that natively supports the tag. You see Wikipedia using the video tag. We jump over to actually SVG is also, SVG 1.2 has video, and you can do all sorts of cool things, right? We have a demo playing. Turn the audio up. We have a video playing. We have a mask on top of it. We have a reflection, and you have text behind it. And what's really cool is you could take your mouse and select that text. So that's what's cool. You asked about, you know, Flash is a great, is a great solution for video many times and all these things. But what's really nice about having this stuff in the web itself is you can integrate with other technologies at a deep level, right? Um, what, is, what does the code look like? You have to do another code review. Let's see if I have a... So really straightforward, you have a, um, a, a new tag you drop in. You have some JavaScript. You can grab a reference to it, play, pause, stop. And this is really cool. You can actually add an event listener that when certain frames are hit, you get called. So you could have a video and have parts of your page updating themselves as different parts of the video go in, maybe to make it interactive, things like that. So unfortunately, where do we stand? We don't stand in a great place of video on the web currently. Yeah, this is one of the few, I, I, I do, I like to be pragmatic about this stuff. I think if something can't be done cross-browser, um, I think JavaScript shims are a great way to, to get things done. I generally didn't include it, but I just thought video is really cool. And what's nice is a lot of work is happening behind the scenes to get this in. Uh, uh, Safari 3.1, Firefox 3.1, Opera are supporting this more and more. And uh, this is something that would be really nice to have. So unfortunately, it's not ready. But it's, uh, it's really it's something to keep an eye on. So we're almost done. Like I said, the open web, there's, there's so much stuff on here. There's a lot of interesting things going on. I wanted to give you a flavor of it. So I wanted to just kind of talk about, I'll answer questions just in a bit. Just for these little other parts of interesting functionality, where do we stand? What can you use today? So client-side storage, this means with the user's permission, you can store more than a cookie. Cookies are like 4K. You can store more data, hundreds of K. And this helps for offline. This helps for performance, for latency. Surprisingly, you can actually, this is ready. This is ready to do. And there are some great options. Uh, there's some good JavaScript shims. Dojo Storage is one that I've done. It works in a million different environments. You can really use client-side storage today. Just drop it in your page. Gears does this as well. So this is something that you can use today cross-browser. Offline. Offline web apps. This is ready as well. Again, using something like Gears, which is like Firefox, Safari, Opera's working on it. Windows Mobile, Android, all over the place. So it's there to be able to use to take things offline. Cross-domain. This is when you want to do, so for example, um, when you embed, you know, like a Google gadget, for example, when it wants to talk to another site, it sometimes needs to talk cross-domain. And it can be really nice for certain situations. This is something you can do today as well, using something called JSONP. Who's heard of JSONP? Yeah, so this is something that works cross-browser. And the final two things is fast JavaScript. We've heard to the V8. We have gone to the V8 talk. Actually, it's in the a later afternoon. Um, what's happening is all the browsers are doing really interesting things around, like vastly, vastly improving the speed of JavaScript. So Firefox has like Trace. There's like Trace Monkey. Oh, Safari has a project. Um, there's V8. Unfortunately, this is something that's almost there. Um, Internet Explorer is not currently doing work around fast JavaScript, but it's showing up in every other browser. And I, 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 I wouldn't doubt that the IE team starts to look at this as well. So I would say in a year or two, JavaScript is going to be a fundamentally different language when it comes to performance. And that's going to be a really interesting situation. And that plays into what I call JavaScript++. This is when you're working on JavaScript and you want to do programming in the large. A really big project. JavaScript is hard to work with. So JavaScript++ are these efforts to you know, keep JavaScript accessible when you're doing smaller programming, but make it easier to work with when you're doing really large projects. Unfortunately, this is something that's not ready, but there's all sorts of interesting things happening behind the scenes as people really firm this up. 
And uh, again, so we're going to see the performance side of JavaScript in the near term really change. And we'll see doing, you, know, you can already do real software engineering with JavaScript, but you'll see that becoming even easier in the more medium term. So I wanted to just end this by saying, yes? Say that one more time. So JavaScript++ plus plus is just a term I'm using because they have more boring sounding names like ECMAScript 4, ECMAScript 3.1. Um, actually, JavaScript toolkits will be able to do even more because JavaScript will be much faster. I think that's a trend you'll see more and more. That, you know, browsers will keep up, but JavaScript itself can do a lot more heavy lifting. That's a good question. So I just want to say take action. Is there, you know, hopefully there's something that you saw today that you didn't expect could be done cross-browser. So just choose one of those. Maybe uh, go to a search engine, type it in, learn a little bit about it. You know, play with it, see if it works for one of your projects. Here's some interesting uh, different sites you can go to. Here's the slides themselves you can download. Code.google.com is sort of the, the open source portal and, and a, where a lot of news around our developer program takes place. Doc type is really unique. This is a wiki that is meant to be a reference guide for the web itself, just like Wikipedia, but as a reference guide. And it's really interesting. To so the team I'm on, we help with this as well. Ajaxian.com has kind of become the watering hole of people interested in the open web, Ajax. Um, it's a great place to go to find out interesting things going on. And finally, the What Working Group, they're the ones who are doing HTML5, if you want to keep track of this. Uh, the mailing list is a really interesting place. There's a lot of mail on it, but there's great discussions happening. What's that? I'm doing HTML5 or ruining HTML5. Are they, so are they doing it or ruining it? I don't know. I don't know. You'll have to. That's great. I mean, we can have that conversation after we end. We can talk about that. <laughs> I'm not ready to have that right now up on stage. It's not coming for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, I know. No, things. I, got... no, I understand. I understand. But um, yes. So, yes. And remember, you have a card that uh, you can fill out what you thought of the talk. You can be honest. And I really appreciate you being here. And thanks.